All right, folks, MinMax Munchkin back with another video. Um, I finally want to come back to my class overviews. Um, I stopped with Cleric last year and I haven't continued with uh, Druid and every other class after that. And I kind of regret that. I think I should have at least made a couple, couple more uh, overviews because that's sort of where you can get my overall opinion on the class and uh, what I think of each feature and uh, each different like spell. So uh, first and foremost I wanna do a shout out to my patron patreons, uh, that's one of the perks of pledging, uh, pledging to my uh, patreon page. So Adar Mills, Corey Close and Frank Fan, Gregory Twartz, Twartz, Jack MLK, Matthew Ewing and Shia Deskin. Again, I know I butchered at least some of your names, but until you tell me otherwise, this is what I think your names should be pronounced. So, yeah, uh, thank you for your uh, time. Th uh, thank you for your financial support. I appreciate it. And hopefully with this video and every other video, I continue... Um, continue fulfilling your pledges that you pledged right so yeah let's get back to the uh, meat of the video the today's topic is druid uh, the class that that's often kind of misunderstood in my opinion um, I know at least in my case not a lot of, a lot of people actually played druid uh, so far I've seen I believe only one well I've seen two but one of those two has been played by me and only for one session so far. I do con I do hope uh, me and my best friend actually continue uh, with that session, with that campaign, because I kind of liked playing Druid for a change, because I think that class has like, it's like a, it's like an unexplored uh, gem. It's it's an unexplored gold mine. So yeah, without going into too many... Uh, tangents and, and my beliefs of the class and my opinions of it uh, the video is actually similar to my other uh, three classes that I reviewed so far the barbarian the bard and the cleric uh, I focus on mechanics of the class of the, the features and uh, capabilities of the class that it's actually written as. Uh, you can always find your inspiration for role playing this class or any, and any other class in literature, in movies, in, in seeing other people play that class, but in terms of mechanics and features, this is where this video comes into play. So, yeah, druids, they're like your spellcasters, they're like uh, your natural... Uh, the class that has most direct ties to nature, it's a divine spellcaster, it is considered a divine spellcaster, but its powers, the powers the druid has, come uh, directly or indi indirectly from nature. So, uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of its basic features, it's got a pretty standard 1d8 die, which most classes in 5th uh, edition Dungeons and Dragons actually have. Um, hit points and hit points at higher levels work as usual, the standard rules apply. Proficiencies, this is the first, uh, this is actually the first point of contention, at least in my opinion. Um, you get light armor, medium armor, and shields, and it says that druid will no, druids will not wear armor or use shields made of metal. But then, right below, you have these weapons proficiencies, and there are a couple of weapons here that definitely use metal. Now, daggers, daggers in most cases are made out of metal, right? Uh, they don't have to be necessarily, but come on, like, most daggers are made out of metal. Now javelins, uh, even darts, maces, uh, sling, uh, even spears, uh, spears. Um, they are. They don't have to be made out of metal, but again, they are definitely in most cases made out of metal. And finally, we have sickles and scimitars, which are invariably made out of metal. Now, what can you actually do about this? Um, 
if your DM actually tells you that you can't wear metal armor because you are a druid, and it says here that druids will not wear armor or use shields made out of metal, um, cool, I mean, the DM has perfect rights to do that, but don't let this disappoint you, like, most people consider druids like a low AC class because of this, uh, let's call it a rule, but I, I, I definitely think of this as more of a guideline. Um, but even, even if the DM prohibits you from wearing metal armor, there's nothing stopping you from finding one made out of, for example, a turtle shell or dinosaur bones or whatever, like, and any DM worth a pinch of salt can easily make a whole side quest just for you obtaining something like that. And it can even be like a fun little story, like a side quest, like a side storyline that you and whole, all of your party actually embark on, like a little bit of journey that's that could actually even be tied into the main storyline, the main quest. Uh, so yeah, I don't think this is a hindrance to you uh, in any any way whatsoever. So if you consider these uh, medium armors, which you are proficient in, um, for example, Turtle, Turtle as a race has an AC of 17 because of its shell. Now, even if, if your DM doesn't actually let you uh, use that AC, right, there's actually no reason not to give you for example, like breastplate type of uh, armor class with the with turtle shell. It's perfectly reasonable. And it, it this is up to DM's fiat. It's up to DM's decision, but unless you're playing with a prick DM or a DM which who, who is overly, overly restrictive, in my opinion, this shouldn't be a problem. It just requires a bit more effort and a bit more, let's call imagination, a bit more creativity. Um, but it's not, it's not something that can be solved. And also, why not? Like, most other classes actually need to just earn gold to buy their armor. But for you, you actually need to embark on that journey into the nature of finding those dinosaur bones, of finding that turtle shell or turtle shell. Um, and for you, it's not about money, it's about the journey, right? And that's what that's actually a mechanical way of actually f playing your character, role-playing your character, right? So yeah, that's actually my opinion on it. Uh, in terms of these other proficiencies, Herbalism Kit obviously makes sense. Um, because you are, you are of nature, you come from nature, your powers are tied to they come from nature. So Herbalism Kit obviously makes sense. Saving throws, you are a brainy kind of class anyway, so intelligence and wisdom definitely makes sense. Um, and skills, you get two from these uh, these ones listed here. Obviously, these are thematic fits. Uh, I would all, I would say that in most cases, if you want to uh, optimize your character, you should definitely take perception uh, because it's the most important skill. And after that, I would say insight is the second best one from this list. But there's nothing stopping you from taking either arcana, animal handling, or survival. And even, even medicine and nature make sense. I'd say religion probably the least useful ones of all, but it still depends on, on the campaign. I'm just going to mention quickly that in a Diablo-inspired campaign that we played, uh, that the buddy of mine DM'd, religion was actually used... Uh, he like reflavored it as faith, uh, and it it had like similar properties as Arcana. Arcana was called, I think, I don't know, but like Arcana is often used for like figuring some or some kind of magic stuff, right? And religion was actually he used it in a similar manner to Arcana with for everything that involved something of divine celestial nature. So if some magic item or spell was of divine or, or magic nature, I believe that's how it worked. So religion, he would he would tell us to, to roll religion, which was reflavored as faith. So yeah, I mean, could be useful, depending on the DM. All campaigns, no campaigns, no campaign is the same, even if it's in the 
uh, in the fa in the Forgotten Realms uh, Faerun setting. Um, so yeah, starting equipment you get the standard stuff basically. Alternatively, the DM might choose to give you some gold at the beginning instead of giving you a starting equipment. This is basically up to DM, but yeah, I mean that's about it. So uh, you get Druidic, similar to rogues, which no thieves can't. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, why, why do I always have dirty thoughts when I when I say thieves can't? All right. Anyway, I am immature. Uh, so Druidic. You know Druidic, the secret language of Druids, makes sense. Druid circles should have some kind of uh, secret codified language which they use to communicate with each other. And yeah, I mean, uh, if, if it comes into a campaign, it can be useful, otherwise it's kind of like a, fl a flavorful ribbon feature. But yeah, I mean, if the DM actually plays to your characters instead of just telling an overall story, this can actually be a neat little feature. Spell casting, pretty standard. You have your druid spell list. You are a full caster. Your uh, spell casting ability is wisdom. Pretty much everything works the way it works for any other class that has spell casting feature. Um, you prepare spells similar to wizards and clerics. Uh, you can prepare up to your druid level plus wisdom modifier. So yeah, that's about it. You do have ritual casting as well, which comes in handy because you do have a lot of ritual spells. And obviously your spell casting focus is your druidic focus, which in most cases is like a staff, which can be used as a quarter staff. So yeah. Um, wild shape, this is your signature druid feature. Something druids are most known for as a class, you get it fairly early at level 2. And uh, yeah, I mean, you assume the shape of the beast that you have seen before. You can use, you have two uses of this feature, and this feature is a short rest mechanic. So between short rests, you can wild shape into a beast two times before you run out of uses. Um, the the type of beast that you can transform into is determined by your druid level. Uh, as shown in the beast shapes table, this like this table here. Uh, but not only is is it limited by your uh, druid level, it's also limited by the type. Uh, so yeah, at second level, the maximum challenge rating is a quarter one, quarter challenge rating one 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 slash. I don't know how it's pronounced. See, like these little stupid things are is where my English sucks. God damn. Um, <laughs> it's probably a quarter, right? Um, that's how you would actually pronounce this number. Uh, so yeah, no flying or swimming speed, so for example, wolf. Um, and obviously as you level up, you these limitations uh, get removed, so at level 4 you, you, you can turn into a swimming creature, you cannot turn into a flying creature. And finally at level 8, you can turn into a giant eagle or other flying creatures of, of challenge rating of one or lower. I think challenge rating one creatures, there's actually nothing else than uh, actually uh, just a, a giant eagle. Um, yeah, okay, there's a giant vulture as well, I guess, but I think eagle is better. It has more hit points. So yeah, anyway, uh, for, for this feature right here, um, you definitely want to get to get familiar with these beast forms. There are a shit ton of them. I don't have time in this video and I don't have even the, the willpower to go over each and every one of these. Uh, you can do it in your free time. I mean, I will touch upon a few of these uh, at some points in the video. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, why not? Uh, but in, in, in essence, like, this is a good starting point for you. This is not an exhaustive list, uh, but it's definitely a list which you can use to reference yourself. It's like an aggregate list of all the beasts in, uh, I think, like, Master's Manual's Volos and uh, a, a couple of uh, other adventure type, adventure based uh, beasts like some of these beasts can only be found found uh, in in published adventures not in any of those uh, monster tones right so yeah this is a good 
uh, thing for you. I, if I remember, I'll link it down below in the video description. And if I actually forgot to do it, forget to do it, remind me in the comments down below, and I'll definitely link it. Um, so yeah, that's about it. Uh, the the feature is actually quite extensive. There's like a wall of text which you get blasted with. Uh, but don't let this scare you. Um, basically, the feature uses your action. Uh, so you use your action to turn into any of these beast shapes um, from this list uh, following these limitations. Um, you can revert to your normal form using uh, earlier by using a bonus action on your turn. Uh, you automatically re revert if you fall unconscious, drop to zero hit points or die. And uh, yeah, I mean... You can stay in your beast shape for a number of hours equal to half your druid level rounded down. So that's about it for the general rules. Now, like there are a cup there are like five of these bullet points which are actually pretty important. Well, at least some of them are. Um, first and foremost, your game statistics are replaced by the statistics of by the statistics of the beast. Uh, you do retain your mental abilities. Uh, but you don't you definitely don't turn into a mindless beast uh, however you combine the proficiencies the, your own proficiencies in skills and whatnot uh, with those of a beast uh, if the beast has the same proficiency as you and the bonus is higher you use the creature's bonus so if, for example if the creature has a plus nine on stealth and you have only plus five as a humanoid in your humanoid form you will use your creatures uh, bonus uh, also you do take the physical stats of a beast <coughs> meaning the hit points uh, and the strength the dexterity and constitution abilities uh, and all excess damage carries over into your humanoid form uh, so also you can't cast spells or do any actions that require hands but you can concentrate on spells and can take actions to maintain those spells uh, so, for example, you definitely can't carry a, a stick or a spear or something else if you are, for example, uh, wild shape into a brown bear or something. That brown bear has its own natural weapons. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you cannot cast spells and anything, but if you cast a spell before wild shaping into any kind of beast, you do maintain concentration on that spell. The wild shaping doesn't disturb the concentration. And also some spells also have uh, the... Some spells actually require you to use your bonus actions or actions to uh, maintain their uh, per round effects. So you can also use those while you are in the beast form. Uh, the most important uh, aspect actually of the beast uh, for of this feature is that you retain all the benefits... Uh, and features from your class, race, or other source. This is very, very, this is probably the most important feature, especially if you multi-class, because if you multi-class, for example, into a barbarian, uh, and I did make a, a, a build exactly like that, you can uh, go to my channel and, and uh, check out the barbarian, 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 moon druid build, which is like an Eberron specific one, because I used the uh, Eberron race to Kalashtar, but yeah, anyway, back to the point, uh, you do retain all the benefits of any features from your class, race, or other source. This means that even your feats work in your uh, beast form as long as the form is physically capable of doing whatever that feat enables you to do, right? Uh, however, there's an important caveat, you cannot use any of your special senses such as dark vision unless your new form also has that sense. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, this is actually very important, like even later on when you get these other features, they also work while you're wild shape as long again as you're physically capable of doing so. Um, now, this last feature I don't actually see, I cannot, I cannot come up with any reasonable well reason why uh, you would choose to drop your equipment on the floor instead of choosing to merging that equipment into your new form right like why would you drop your equipment on the ground if you can just merge that equipment into a new form uh, in either case the equipment 
doesn't change to match the new form uh, and the equipment doesn't work so all of your luck stones rings of protection or any other um, items that you might actually possess and you might be attuned to they don't work in this uh, form unless uh, as long as they are merged into this form basically as long as you are in your uh, beast form those magic items just don't work um, so yeah, this is actually important as well uh, for those magic items, but uh, in terms of dropping your equipment again for the last time, I don't see why would you why why you would ever choose to do this. Uh, I mean, I guess some of you will prove me otherwise. I mean, I guess I'm not imaginative at the moment enough, or I just not creative enough. But uh, yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, uh, probably there are situations. I don't know. Maybe if you're, if you pick a, f if you are falling down and 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 you have a, I don't know. I don't even know, man. Let's just move on. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, also, there's this list here, uh, which uh, you should def uh, definitely uh, check out. Uh, it has, I think, pretty much every beast. Uh, on it, uh, why? Because, uh, like, there's an important thing right here in the feature. Um, you can assume the shape of a beast that you have seen before. Now, this is a point of contention between many druids and their DMs. So, definitely, this is one of the reasons why you should talk to your DM right at the session zero, or if there's no session zero, at before the first session of the new campaign even begins. Um... Or even if, for example, your character dies and then you choose to roll out your druid, you should definitely talk to your consult your DM beforehand. So this is actually this link right here and I'll include it in the description if I remember later on. And again, if I don't, remind me in the comments. Um, this actually, this, this enables you to list these beasts to like uh, filter them th uh, by environment. Uh, and uh, probably source, but yeah, I mean just pick any source um, So yeah, for example, if you come from Arctic regions, these these are the types of monsters that are Kind of recommended for Arctic type of environment if you come from uh, Let's say swamp uh, environment. You have all these beasts to choose from right? Uh, and again like you get the point right so there's all the there are all these environments that that are kind of relevant because you, if you come from the forest, if you come from the Underdark, you will be uh, meeting different types of beasts, like the flora and fauna of that environment is different. So this is also a good uh, good resource to consult yourself and your DM before you roll your uh, druid. So yeah, uh, most of the other uh, general druid features that all druids get come very late like from level 18 and above so uh, definitely let's dive into these druid circles and let's see what they can offer us first and foremost we have the circle of the dreams uh which is your heal healing centric type of druid i'd say because i mean what else what else there is at like level 2 feature uh, the way I see this feature is basically you have a pool of quasi-healing word castings that don't require spending spell slots. Um, now, obviously, if you don't know what healing word is, that's basically... It's, it's a spell that heals creatures, has a bit of a range, uh, 1d4 plus your spell casting ability modifier. Now, comparing this feature with the healing word feature, it definitely... it has double the range... But on average, it does provide a bit less healing than the casting of an actual spell. Uh, it is great for bringing your allies up from zero hit points while maintaining favorable action economy and preserving spell slots at the same time. Um, this does use your bonus action, so in that regard it's favorable again for action economy. And yeah, I mean, why waste spell slots on healing words or other healing spells when you can just bonus action spend your uh, 1d6 or 2d6 uh, and bring the creature up from the from the 
uh, from the dead, from the dying, right? This is a long rest feature, kind of makes sense in my opinion. It would be a bit broken if it was a, a, a short rest mechanic because it goes off of your uh, druid level and for example if you are a 20th level druid who's capable of dropping uh, 20 d6 and then short rest and then do it again. It's kind of, yeah, I mean, this should be a long rest feature. Um, now, Hearth, Hearth of the Mo Moonlight and Shadow is another spell-like feature, ability. This is basically a less defensible, but also less apparent version of Leomund's Tiny Hut spell. Uh, this is awesome, this is definitely an awesome feature if you don't have a level 5 wizard or druid in your party. Um... A guy in my comp in a campaign that I played uh, in the the Diablo inspired campaign that I mentioned a bit before actually played the, the Circle of the Dreams Druid and this feature was was actually very very use useful um, and uh, yeah I mean uh, basically enables you to hide in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness uh, by having this plus five bonus to Dex and this and also being a bit more perceptive. Um, I believe it doesn't say it in this feature, but I believe it works on passive wisdom perception. So automatically every party member has uh, more chance, like better chance of spotting any enemy that might be sneaking sneaking upon the party. And yeah, I mean uh, the apparent uh, feature is like obviously uh, the, the total cover blocks the sphere. Uh, but uh, the sphere, yeah, okay, the sphere, the sphere vanishes, but the sphere isn't visible, like nothing inside the sp sphere is visible outside of it. Uh, with Leoman's tiny hut, like, the, the dome itself is opaque and therefore apparent to anybody looking in the general direction of the dome, right? So, in that regard, yeah, I mean, nothing can get in and out of the Leoman's tiny hut, but on the other end, on the other side... Uh, Heart of the Moonlight and Shadow is definitely less apparent. It's definitely harder to spot uh, this uh, this little uh, ball of awesomeness compared to Liam and Stanley. There's pros and cons. Um, definitely, this is also good because it doesn't uh, waste your doesn't require spell slot. Even if though Liam and Stanley is a ritual spell, uh, you can just use your action. Uh, and uh, whatever it doesn't act even actually say an action, but yeah, I mean it's it's instantaneous effect for Leoman Stani Hut in order not to waste a spell slot You need to cast this for ten full minutes uh, This can even be like a pinch like like just like plop it down and Hope that the monster chasing you down the hallway doesn't spot you uh, So yeah, I mean definitely this is a good feature Hidden paths, uh, teleport is always good to have in a pinch, but compared to, for example, Shadow Monk's level 6 feature, Shadow Step, which also uses a bonus action to teleport from one dark or dimly lit spot to another, this feature is a bit underwhelming in my opinion. Now, yeah, this feature works in any kind of lighting, uh, but waiting for more levels to get the feature that Shadow Monk basically gets at level 6 and I, I, a couple of other classes also get similar features. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's kind of underwhelming, still useful, but yeah, okay. Kind of, kind of weak. Now, Walker in Dreams is very, very, very interesting in my opinion. Uh, it enables you to, when you finish a short rest, uh, you can cast one of the following spells without expending a spell slot or requiring material components. Now, a dream, like this is a short rest feature. So, uh, you, there's definitely ways to use this feature creatively. Dream, for example, can be used to mess with, uh, for example, your big bad evil end guy. Uh, for example, multi-classing into two levels of divination wizard comes to mind instantly. With the portent ability uh, to potentially force the creature to fail the wisdom saving throw uh, required in the dream spell. Um, and then knock on the door after that creature failed that wisdom saving throw multi like several days in a row. So that feature, so that creature now suffers from, uh, from two or even more levels of exhaustion and maybe doesn't even have its hit points. 
uh, its max hit points. So yeah, there's definitely ways to use this uh, use this feature uh, using this particular spell very very aggressively. And uh, this is just one of this is just one type of scenario that I that I can think of. There's definitely surely more uses. I mean, your creativity is the ceiling. By which you can use this spell and any other spell. Uh, scrying, definitely very useful. Always good uh, as uh, spying information, gathering utility. Doing it once per short rest for free is like even better. Um, so yeah, I mean, why not? Give it to me. Uh, short rest, wait one hour, cast scrying without spending a spell slot or material components, whatever. Um, definitely, definitely good. If you don't know, uh, yeah, here it is. Uh, I'm not gonna read the read the spell. It's gonna take a while. We don't have time. So yeah, there's that's that's it. That's it for Druid. And finally, teleportation circle. Uh, the version of the teleportation circle that you can cast uh, is special, kind of limited, situational, but it can be used for like sort of like a fast travel kind of option, which is basically free. And you can like just, for example, for ex I don't know, like run away or something. Yeah, I mean, situations might arise where you will be able to use even this spell. Uh, and it might definitely come in handy. Uh, with that said, let's move on to the circle of the land. Now, this circle is unquestionably, mechanically, definitely similar with uh, wizard and cleric classes. Uh, these mechanics, like uh, mechanical similarities are great in my opinion, like mechanically great, uh, but they also make this circle the least unique of all uh, circles we are going to talk about in this video today. Now don't get me wrong, if you are the only spellcaster in a party, which also needs a healer at the same time, this circle will fit the bill almost perfectly. However, the similarities are definitely so apparent the, that he, they really beg the question whether this circle was added in the player's handbook just because the designers figured they can't launch the finished product without at least one or more option for Druid. So, slapping these play-tested, balanced, well-thought-out mechanics into another option for a Druid was a quick fix shortcut to achieve this desired result. Now, maybe I'm wrong, maybe they just figure this is the way to do it. But in my opinion, it's so similar that, I don't know, it kind of feels uh, rushed, like a hack, hack, like a shortcut way to um, do it. I'm not hating it, I'm not even like hating it, I'm just stating what what I feel like is at, is at place, is at hand here. Like, so, first and foremost, you get this bonus cantrip, which now makes you on par with wizards number of cantrips known um so uh yeah i mean if you, if you check this like if you check the wizard uh he knows three cantrips and druid knows only two now the druid also knows three cantrips um natural recovery is basically wizards arcane recovery uh the wording differences uh are so like almost irrelevant like it's basically a reflavored arcane recovery the slight wording difference in druid's case it says during short rest and in wizard's case it says uh when you finish a short rest is basically irrelevant like what's the difference like and everything else is the same uh round it up uh round it up based on half of your druid level half of your wizard level and none of the slots can be of level 6 or higher, same as the druid here. Um, now, uh, here it does say you can't use this feature again until you finish a short, a long rest. Uh, but yeah, here it says once a day. So it's basically just reworded re differently named uh, wizard feature. And it, it also like shares half of the name. Here it says natural recovery. And here arcane recovery. Again, I'm not hating on this, but... Like, this is so painfully similar, like, almost the same, that definitely feels like they just shortcutted, hacked their way into this uh, circle. Um, circle spells, uh, mechanically, this this feature, again, is this is your 
mechanically similar to cleric domain spells feature. You get two additional spells uh, that are always prepared for you based on your level uh, and they don't count against the number of spells you can prepare each day. So yeah, similar to, to clerics, similar to even paladins to some extent, this is the copy paste feature, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, in my opinion, Arctic, uh, Coast and uh, Grassland are very, very... They kind of stand out in terms of power, while I'd say Swamp and Forest kind of leave a little bit to be desired for. But none of these are actually weak. They are just kind of, in terms of pure power, I'd say, uh, yes, uh, Arctic Coast and Grassland are kind of better, in my opinion, than these other ones. Example, Arctic, Cold Person. Uh, slow. They are, these are like major debuff spells. Even Spike Growth and Sleet Storm can be useful. Uh, and these other ones, Free of Movement can be very, very useful for getting out of like shackles or whatever. Ice Storm, again, very, very cool spell. Commune with Nature, your divination spell for finding out information from nearby. And Cone of Cold, again, like thematically makes sense and a very decent damaging spell. Coast, mirror image and misty step. What other third, what other second level spells do you want to actually instantly increase your survivability? Mirror image basically makes three copies of you, and if the creature doesn't have true sight, which most creatures don't, at level three definitely probably no creature. Um, this is like you have four versions of yourself, and the creature probably hits the illusion and not you. Misty Step, when your mirror image illusions run out, you just Misty Step out of the danger, right? Fifth level, Water Breathing, Water Walk, walk makes sense for Coast, thematically useful in, in, in many situations as well. Uh, control Water, Freedom of Movement, again, Control Water and Freedom of Movement, very, very good spells. And finally, level 9, you can Conjure Elemental, you get it for free. Now, um, you get, this is a, a druid, druid uh, spell, druids get this spell on the, their spell list, but you get it for free, you don't have to waste, like, you, you get it prepared for free, it doesn't count towards the uh, spells uh, you can prepare. So, yeah, I mean, uh, and scrying again, like, <laughs> it's damn, like, all of these spells. Um, and uh, 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 grassland, invisibility, pass without trace. Uh, haste, like superb buffing spell, daylight can be used to just basically dispel darkness, invisibility, just walk around without anybody seeing you, pass without trace, plus, plus 10 to stealth, right, yeah, plus 10 to stealth, yeah, I mean, god damn, look at this, anyway, let's not waste too much time on these uh, other, other ones, I kind of think that Definitely Swamp and Forest kind of leave a little bit to be desired for, but they're not bad. They're just kind of a bit less powerful than these other ones. So yeah, anyway, um, moving on. Uh, we have Lent Stride. Uh, ignoring difficult terrain is great as a level 6 feature. But all of this plant stuff is kind of a bit too situational if you ask me. I mean... I mean, I guess if you're fighting against shambling mounts and trends, I guess... I mean, it, it happened so far in my campaign. My players in a campaign that I DM, they fought shambling mounts and and uh, trends. But in 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 most in in both cases, this feature would be basically irrelevant because they have they're like OP, so <laughs> that, it wouldn't even matter. Um, yeah. Um, Level 10 feature, Nature's Ward, 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 I don't know. Immunity to poison and disease is cool on its own, definitely. Uh, but definitely a bit a bit weak as a level 10 feature compared to, for example, Paladin, who gets immunity to disease at level 3. Uh, now, immunity to charmed and frightened condition uh, by elementals or fey? I mean, again, it's kind of situational. I mean, yeah, I mean, you will probably at some point come up, come upon elementals and fey, but not even every elemental and fey has, like, ability to inflict frightened and charmed conditions. So, yeah, I mean, first and foremost, 
these types of creatures they won't come up all the time and even if they do not all of them inflict charm or frighten so it's kind of meh um nature sanctuary as a feature is um I don't see the point of this. Uh, a 14th level character, giving a 14th level character a luck based defensive feature against beasts and plants is a bit weird if you ask me. At the level 14, even a mighty T-Rex or Trent uh, shouldn't pose too much of a problem. Um, I mean, you have 7th level spells. Uh, what's a T-Rex gonna do against some, I don't I don't even know, level 7 spell? Like, you, you just don't care about this. Does, yeah, I mean, it deals deals a fairly high level of damage, whatever. And maybe if you don't have any spell slots left, yeah, okay. But, yeah, even then, I don't know, man. This spell, this feature kind of feels weird. And even Trent, like, what's a Trent gonna do? Multi-attack, slam you, what, animate trees? What, I, you don't even care. You don't even care. Um, you have you're a seven level spellcast. You have a shit ton of spells to, to, to just get out of the situation where a monster tries to slam you or throw rocks at you. Um, now again, if for example, <laughs> if if your DM decides to drop something like an uber beast such as giant space hamster um, of ill omen, woolly Rupert. Uh, which is like a challenge rating 21, uh, which I, even then, like, a disadvantage won't have too much of an impact, really, when the beast has plus 16 to hit with both his melee weapon, whatever. Yeah, I mean, th this feature is kind of, I don't know, it's kind of whatever. It's kind of definitely stupid. Um, yeah, okay, so, Circle of the Moon, moving on. Um, moving on to the Circle of the Moon, definitely, objectively, still the most powerful and probably the easiest druid subclass to play, period. Combat Wild Shape, uh, using your bonus action instead of action to use Wild Shape is right, right off the bat a huge action economy buff. The bonus action self-healing on top of that using your spell slots while not efficient way to spend those spell slots is def definitely offers significant tanking capability because you can just maintain you can grind your way through the damage now on itself this is this is very very good but when you combine it with circle of forms which basically enables you to be able to turn into a brown bear dire wolf or tiger at level 2 uh, which which are like very very powerful beasts and level 2 you have like I don't know 15 health or something like that and then you turn into a beast which has double on that even more um, and it hits more than you can hit right like it, it has multi attack um, yeah this is like this is crazy like this is legitimately one of the craziest uh, druid forms that you can be um, druid circles that you can be and uh, doing doing it like a bonus section you can heal yourself you have self healing and then you have on top of that all of these beast forms that you have access to yeah I mean okay you are definitely still limited uh, by these uh, other uh, limitations uh, so you cannot turn into any flying or swimming beast but you have so many of these beasts that are just like land based you you don't even care <laughs> it's just so powerful um and yeah i mean uh, this feature also scales as you level up so at level six you can turn into a, a challenge rating two at level nine you can turn into a challenge rating three and so on now at level six you get primal strike basically magical attacks uh in beast form at level six which is just about right if you ask me you come across monsters with resistances to physical damage from non-magical sources even even before level 5, very often. Um, so being able to overcome those resistances early into tier 2 of your character progression, I'd say definitely makes sense for a combat-oriented subclass. 
Uh, and also one important point, uh, the this feature kind of scales super defensively at later levels uh, with all the self-healing and the high, high hit point beasts that you can turn in. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, the damage of those beasts, the damage output is decent, but nowhere close to some of the multi-class builds and even single-class characters out there, for example, fighter with four attacks, or even three attacks at level 11. Like, what, what you cannot, you cannot compete in terms of damage output with those classes, but definitely your survivability... The amount of hit points, the, the amount of abuse you can take in this form is just is just crazy. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, if I didn't mention, I think I did. I made a multi-class build between a, a bear barbarian, um, a totem bear barbarian and a moon druid, which basically, uh, and also a Kalashtar race, which is basically resistant to every point, every conceivable type of damage out there. Um... And uh, uh, on top of that is a Circle of the Moon Druid, so it's just ridiculous. Like, the hit points that build has is crazy. Um, so yeah, go check that out if you haven't so far. It's called uh, Bear Barbarian uh, Moon Druid uh, Kalashtar Eberron build. It's on my channel. Um, so yeah, moving on to the level 10 feature, Elemental Wild Shape. Why? While uh, it's a level... 10 feature, yeah, sure, it's a very powerful one, still, uh, so why, why, for example, at level 10, be a measly ankylosaurus, um, which is, okay, I mean, nothing to be, to be, uh, excited about, it's kind of, it, it, it's a bag of hit points that hits once, that's it, um, instead of doing that, you can turn into one of the elementals, which are way, way, way more powerful, um, and, uh, in my opinion, Air Elemental is the best one, even though it has the least amount of hit points. Why? Because the relatively low hit points compared to other Elemental forms is the only drawback it pretty much has. Um, the Earth Elemental is close second, but it has vulnerability against Thunder Damage. While Thunder Damage is not, like, very prevalent type of damage, it still is a vulnerability when you get paired against some, I don't know, any beast that deals thunder damage, any monster, yeah, you are kind of screwed. Um, because this two 126 hit points is basically, I don't know, 63. Um, so yeah, and fire elemental and water elemental, they are also, they have this like uh, water susceptibility, which are like, you're very vulnerable against water if you're fire, I mean, makes sense. And uh, Water Elemental obviously um, has a weakness against uh, f being frozen. Uh, so it's already s fairly slow. Movement speed is now reduced by 20 feet. So it's only got 10 feet movement speed. And Cold Damage is a fairly prevalent type of damage in 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know, I may be remembering this incorrectly, but I think I've read somewhere that Cold Damage... Uh, opposed to to very widely held belief is actually more prevalent even than fire damage now i don't know if that's correct i don't have the stats i don't have the an, uh, analysis on my part i just remember that i kind of, i vaguely remember reading about it somewhere so yeah i don't i don't even like water elemental and even if that's not true i do know from experience cold damage definitely comes up very often in play so yeah, Air Elemental, that's the way to go if you ask me. That is definitely the way to go. All of these damage resistances, even the immunities, condition immunities, dark vision, fly movement speed of 90 feet. God damn, you're, you're like a... You're, 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 you, you can catch anything. I mean, you are a blob of air, basically. Uh, and multi-attack, decent slam option, decent uh, recharge option, basically 50% of the time you will have this whirlwind, which is... Me thematically cool, mechanically definitely also makes sense. Yeah, I mean, very, very good elemental form. And finally, we have uh, our Thousand Forms level 14 feature. With all the powerful features you get at level 10, 6, 2, you kind of need one which is a bit weaker. And unfortunately, your level 14 feature is your ribbon feature. 
But still, a second level spell which is basically a cantrip for you. Uh, which enables you to, I don't know, uh, uh, live underwater, blend into or become somebody else. And do a bit more damage if you find yourself in a situation, situation where you are stripped of all of your weapons and gear. I mean, it can still be useful. It's basically a cantrip. And uh, yeah, I mean, why not? Give it to me. Uh, so yeah, that's about it. Um, Circle of the Shepherd. Circle of the Shepherd Druid. This is the one I personally like the most. Uh, I think the concept behind this circle is very, very uh, appealing. Uh, makes sense for a type of class the Druid is. Uh, with direct ties to nature. It makes sense to have some kind of beast and face summoning specialist option, right? And I'd say in terms of power, it comes very close to Moon Druid. You could even make an argument that it's even more powerful, but it's kind of a bit more complicated. It's a bit harder to play. And it definitely, the power it has is achieved in a completely different way. Instead of accumulating all power within yourself by becoming this powerful beast, you manifest this power by spreading it to your allies and the creatures that, you're, that you summon. And I even made a recurring 14th level Draw Shepherd Druid NPC in a campaign that I'm currently DMing. Just because I'm so biased towards and I'm so in love with this uh, circle, I like, I like, I, I definitely, if you ask me which I, which druid I prefer the most, this is the one. This is definitely the one. Uh, so, Speech of the Woods. Uh, right off the bat, most fake creatures speak Sylvan. Uh, and so, it is a perfect for campaigns taking place in wilderness. And also, you can communicate with beasts. Which, um, which should also come in play fairly often considering that every bird, every rat, every bunny, every beetle and every squirrel out there is a beast. So you being able to communicate with those beasts basically enables you to have near infinite amount of chances to figure what's going on around in the wilderness, in the woods, in the desert, in the, in the arctic, in the swamps, like... Any creature you come across, you can communicate with. So, yeah, I mean, use this. This is a very, very powerful feature. Because it enables you to have insight unlike any other druid out there. Uh, even druids that learn, like, speak with animals and beast bond and stuff like that. Like, yeah, I mean, they can emulate this feature, but they have to waste spell slots to do it. You don't have to spend spell slots. You don't have to cast spells. You just can do it. Uh, Spirit Totem, this is this is like... This is it. This is the feature. This is the feature why I initially fell in love with this subclass. So basically, you have three awesome indestructible, nearly indestructible, mobile auras with huge radius that use a bonus action to turn on and move and be moved around for like 60 feet every 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 turn and on top of that are a short rest mechanic uh, sign me up sign me up i'm sold give it to me um we have uh, i mean obviously the spirit persists for 1 minute or until you're incapacitated that's why i said it's almost it's almost uh, indestructible it, you, it's nor it's not a creature not an object so as long as you are not incapacitated nothing can remove it from the battlefield um uh, and it's a short test feature so yeah i mean first and foremost we have a bear uh, spirit which basically uh enables you to have these additional hit temporary hit points and advantage on stretch checks and strength saving throws so five plus druid level temporary hit points is super awesome at level uh, level two don't get me wrong even level 3 and maybe level 4, but at later levels kind of doesn't scale that well. It definite into later levels, obviously, but um, I mean, it's still good, don't get me wrong. Like, at level 10, you will give everybody in the aura, every creature of your choice, 15 temporary hit points. That is not bad. It's just kind of... It's not that well scaled, in my opinion, considering the hit points bloat that you get just by leveling up. 
and uh, the creatures at level 10 have like all most creatures have way above 100 hit points so yeah i mean it's good it's just not that 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 good however advantage on strength checks is quite useful for those barbarians in your party for example who like to grapple fuck everything that radiates body heat right so a bonus flavor also for synergy points if that particular barbarian in your party just so happens to be a bear totem spirit uh, one which let's be honest more than 50 percent of barbarians out there in any particular party end up being anyway because it's legitimately one of the best barbarian archetypes out there right uh, so yeah bonus points for that <laughs> because even the names and everything like fits so well together spirit totem bear spirit totem bear spirit goddamn everything fits uh, then we have a hawk spirit which is legitimately in my opinion probably the weakest one of the three options uh, spending your reaction just to give somebody an advantage on attack roll is kind of underwhelming if you ask me especially with unicorn spirit this is, a, uh, in my opinion, the best aura, if you ask me. Uh, I re referenced it in, in my old Ultimate Healer video, which you can find on my channel if you just go. Um, uh, I, if I remember, I'll link it somewhere in the upper right corner, but I'll probably forget, because this video is already one hour long, and I know I'm gonna talk for like another half an hour at least. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, so uh, keeping up with the tradition of this channel, just doing my doing my work, doing doing the, syner the, the signature moves of my channel. So yeah, anyway, uh, without, uh, without too many, too many digressions. Um, so yeah, uh, the best error, if you ask me, referenced it in my old uh, uh, build, what, what it does. Uh, the advantage on checks to detect creatures that are in the aura is a bit situational, but the healing potential uh, of casting, for example, just one healing word um, is downright obnoxious. Um, when you consider that level 6 feature, which we'll talk about in a few seconds, well, maybe even a few minutes, um, what it gives you, um, it's downright broken. Uh, and obviously, again, healing word uh probably close it okay there it is so for example you cast healing word on one creature you heal it for 1d4 plus plus whatever wisdom modify and then on top of all of that you add uh the healing which basically which equals your druid level god damn even at level two this is major because at level two you have like i don't know 15 hit points at best like maybe 20 if you're a barbarian so even two hit points additional healing for every character inside of air, inside of aura. That's this is it, man. This is this is the aura that I assume if you ever play this circle, uh, you're going to use the most because it's just it's just damn 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 good. Uh, now level six uh, mighty summoner at level six any beast or fey summoned or created or created. This is very important by your spells gains the following benefits so summoned or created by your spells um additional two hit points per die per hit die means that monsters like giant ape or t-rex get additional 20 30 hit points and if you don't know there's this famous conjure woodland beings spell the spell summons eight fake creatures and pixies are fake creatures each pixie can cast polymorph once a day each pixie can polymorph a sufficiently high level or challenge rating creature into a t-rex or any other high challenge rating beast so with with one fourth level spell slot fourth level spell with this feature all of those T-Rexes have like 26 additional hit points. That is like 8 times... Well, that's that's crazy. Look at this. Um, 26 times 8. That is like 208 additional hit points just from this level 6 feature. That is crazy. On top of that combo being crazy to begin with. 
um, th that combo just becomes even scarier. Uh, the real power uh, lies in the fact that those summon creatures have magical attacks uh, on top of all of that, which makes this feature as relevant on level 6 as it is like, like as relevant on level 6 and, 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 and onward, right? So, yeah, that's about it. I mean, this is... This is basically emulating the uh, Circle of the Moon, where you are uh, concentrating all of this power in yourself, and then you on level 6 you get magical attacks. With this thing, with this mighty summoner, your all of your summons have magical attacks. And don't forget, like, created or summoned. So those T-Rexes do get these magical uh, attacks. And this is also one of the reasons why I said potentially this circle could be even more powerful than the circle of the moon it is going to uh, depend a lot of your uh, a lot on your dm your dm might decide that you cannot choose which fake creatures you you uh, conjure with your conjure woodland being spell uh, he might decide that pixies have never seen a t-rex and then they they cannot uh, polymorph eight creatures into t-rexes i mean your dm has a lot of power in that decision but there is a possibility so with the possibilities sometimes it will happen and if it happens to you please let me know in the comments uh, how glorious it was i want to live vicariously through your own experiences and adventures because i just love this shit um guardian spirit your summons get passive healing in the aura which is even more crazy uh not only not only can you heal them with your unicorn spirit now they get healing every time uh, they, when a beast or fate that you summoned or created again with a spell ends its turn in your spirit totem area. So just ending their turn in any of these three auras and especially in the unicorn spirit aura means that you you have a potential to out heal the damage they receive. Um, and this is this is crazy. This is just pure craziness. Um, in, if if you ask me. So yeah. Basically, all of your summons with just a single, with, with you just spamming healing word every round will get like 1.5 levels of your druid additional healing. That's basically what it boils down to when you use Unicorn Spirit Aura at level 10. That's it. And finally, Faithful Summons at level uh, 14. Uh, you, If you are reduced to 0 hit points or incapacitated against your will, you can blah 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 blah. With this feature, you almost want to get knocked out in every battle. You almost want to get near dying. Why? Free summoning of 4 challenge rating 2 beasts with magical natural weapons, right, is relevant even at level 14. It's a long rest mechanic and if you ask me, it definitely should be. Because making it a, a, a short rest mechanic would be, well, plain broken, if you ask me. Definitely. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, I don't know, like, this, uh, this, this, this circle is, man, if you ask me, I mean, in my opinion, I think this is more powerful. This is definitely more powerful than the Moon Dream. Because every, every feature that you guests get on this list is, is super good. Super good, like a 14th level a Circle of the Moon feature, meh. 14th level Circle of the uh, uh, Circle of the Shepherd, god damn. You you get dropped to zero hit points, four more creatures appear on the battlefield. Yeah, they are challenge rating too, but check this out. It summons four breeze of your choice, and I will briefly touch upon uh, this list here. Challenge rating two. Look at this: saber tooth tiger, polar bear. If cave bear is basically the same. There's this giant constrictor snake. Look at these beasts. Look at these beasts, man. These beasts are no joke. 60 hit points, giant constrictor snake, constrict, grapple, uh, piercing, not, not a lot of damage, but you can do stuff with this, man. This is no joke. Trust me. And these bears, multi-attack, plus 7 to hit, 9 damage on 12 damage on average. This is all, like, 42 hit points, nothing to be ashamed of. Saber Tooth Tiger can prone a creature. Doesn't have multi attack. Plus six to hit decent still. A bit more damage than bears. Prone in the cr Dude. Trust me. You can choose these beasts. Again, your DM might tell you that 
for whatever reason, even though in the... See, like, this is where I would... Especially for a 14th level druid. I would say that you get to choose any creature from this list. Um, I would even argue with my DM. I, 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 I sometimes do get into this rules lawyering. Uh, mode because it definitely tells you it summons four beasts of your choice that are challenge rating for two or lower the way this feature is worded right is different than the wild shape feature uh, uh that we talked about before because the wild shape feature does say that you assume a shape of the beast that you have seen before so you must see the creature in order to turn into it um this feature right here, the 14th level uh, Faithful Summons, doesn't say you have to see the feature. Again, your DM does have the right to tell you, well, you cannot choose anything. I'll give you the, I'll give you the shortlist of options you have, right? So you can only pick some of these. But in my opinion, the way it's worded, you just you can do whatever, whatever the fuck you want, right? Whatever the fuck you want. And uh, I mean. If my if my best friend uh, uh, who knows uh, what I'm who I'm talking about is watching this right now, and uh, I'd say like he would probably tell me that I cannot choose like any anything. He would probably give me a shortlist, and um, yeah, I mean I would probably get into an ar argument with him, and I just like furiously leave the leave the session, which actually happened in real life, and I stopped playing in his game. Yeah, I'm a bit of a prick sometimes, I admit it. I admit I have flaws. I do. We are we are all flawed human beings. Anyway, last but not least, Circle of Spores. Spores uh, the most recent edition, uh, official, officially released, that arrived with the release of uh, Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. Circle of Spores definitely has the most sinister, dark flavor to it. And considering how much damage the civilization inflicts upon nature, and as far as I know, definitely like in Ravnica, the civilization is advanced and all of that shit, it makes sense to have at least one more vindictive subclass. Because you definitely sometimes need that druid which will go, alright, enough is enough. Let's kill these mother mother efforts, right? I don't wanna I don't wanna swear too much. Uh, I do swear a lot in my real life, but I do make an effort not to do it in these videos. A few slip ups here and there happen uh, in this video as well. I I'm I'm aware in this video as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely that it makes sense. Circle spells similar to land druid, you learn additional cantrip. In this case, it's chill touch, so I don't like I don't consider this a wizard uh, because. You being able to just learn one country basically means that this is a feature, this is not a choice. Um, so this is definitely a bit less similar to a wizard, even though you do get additional country. Um, the country and the most spells belong to the Necromancy School of Magic. These spells that you get, again, similar to Cleric, uh, who gets prepared spells for free. You also get prepared spells for free, but... They are very, very thematic. They are like, most of them are tied to Necromancy School of Magic. And the whole thing, like from level 2 to level 14, has this The Last of Us vibe. Like, right. This is like, The Last of Us basically means that there's this like fungal, in fungal infection which turns people into zombie-like creatures. And with this druid with like these spores and fungal infestations and fungal body and all of that, even the spells, the gaseous form, the gentle repose, the deafness, blind, blight, right? Everything just reeks of that Last of Us vibe. This is, whoever made this circle definitely, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure, um, was inspired by the Last of Us and granted it's a fairly, fairly good game. Uh, I will admit I didn't play this game. I watched a lot of videos on YouTube, probably spent like a full week worth of uh, working hours, so probably like 50, 50 or maybe even more hours just watching Last of Us videos. So yeah, I'm fairly familiar with the franchise, uh, but yeah, I mean definitely this is this is it. Like This is the druid that is so so intricately tied to, 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 to something like this, right? Um, so yeah, let's del delve into the, the mechanics. Um, we already covered that, so you get all of these spells, anime dead, you can definitely easily 
uh, reflavor these as not just your ordinary standard necromat necromantic magic zombies, uh, but instead they're like definitely like similar to these these ones like operating like raising them through fungal infection not by casting some spell i mean any any dm like willing to accommodate your wishes your role playing your way of role playing your mechanics i think it makes sense like why not like why not doesn't doesn't mechanically change anything you still raise zombies or even skeletons but uh, yeah just doing it through a different means um so uh yeah uh moving on from the spells you have halo of spores so any creature moving into a 10 feet range from you can trigger your reaction that involves flinging these toxic spores uh the damage is decent at level 2 additional uh, 1d4 necrotic damage decent why not but definitely scales poorly at later levels instead of multiplying this die even like less frequently the die basically becomes 1d6 1d8 and 1d10 so basically your damage gets increased on average by uh, on average by one every four levels every four levels you get an increase of one damage and if you've played D&D for any amount of time, the four levels of advancement means that for every level, the creatures on average have like, I don't know, 10 or more hit points per level. Or maybe even more, I don't know. But definitely, the feet bloat compared to the... Comparing the, feet, uh, comparing the hit points bloat of monsters that you encounter as you level up with the amount of damage increase that this feature offers is it, it's not balanced it's def it definitely scales poorly um symbiotic entity again second level another second level feature instead of wild shaping into a beast you become one of the s one with the spores right um so uh, yeah you become something like this but you don't become mindless you're still aware what you're doing you're like you're you're a, you're a highly functioning fungal zombie I like this. Um, so yeah, four temporary hit points uh, per druid level is actually quite a lot. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It scales very, very well. Uh, doubles your hit, your halo spores damage. Kind of nice. I mean, one d four on average is two point five, so five hit five damage on average at level two is definitely decent, but like. 3.7 damage on average at level 6, eh, kind of okay, but at level 10, 10 additional, uh, like 9 additional damage, it's not gonna matter, uh, definitely not gonna matter, um, so yeah, that's about it, unfortunately, and also, like, that's a poison dam deal, uh, your uh, melee weapon attacks deal an extra 1d6 poison damage to any target they hit, there's no scaling with this at, at all, like, this at least offer some kind of scaling this doesn't scale at all which immediately puts me into this mind frame of thinking about multi-classing into uh, a ranger or fighter for that extra attack or and even opting for two weapon fighting style just to use that bonus action to to stab or hit or slash the creature one more time to just inflict that 1d6 poison damage which actually might even be a viable way to build a character Huh, let me, let me actually, let me, let me put that on the, ah, I'll do it later. Alright, so, <clears throat> definitely puts me in that mind frame, uh, because it, the optimizer in me cannot avoid doing that. Fungal infestation level 6, keeping up with the fungal flavor, the fungal theme, you get another reaction option. It's a bit rare seeing a single subclass option like this, bottlenecking the uh, bottlenecking not on action not even on a bonus action but actually the reaction so now level six you have three reaction options you have your attack of opportunity you have your halo of spores and uh, you have your fungal infestation so yeah okay um you raise uh so you get another reaction right so instead of using your reaction on halo of spores you can raise a one hit point zombie which acts after your your turn 
and can only use the attack action. This this can you can only do uh, if the creature, uh, if the humanoid or a beast that is small or medium dies within 10 feet of you. So it's kind of situational, it's not going to come up f very often because of the limited range and it being only a beast and a humanoid, still it, it can come up. And uh, yeah, it's it's uh, definitely very weird and very refreshing seeing a class not bottlenecking on, a on action or bonus action, but instead bottlenecking on reaction. Um, while that's definitely not a good thing, I think the fact that this is kind of situational is not going to matter that much. It's not like these two features are not going to cancel each other out that often. Um, it's a, it's limited by your wisdom modifier and it's a long rest mechanic. For level 6 I think this is still a bit too weak, especially if you compare it to for example Shepard or Moon Druid which get those magical attack attacks. I think not limited, not limiting this feature by your wisdom modifier, or alternatively making it a short rest feature. Uh, I would, I think it would definitely make it a more balanced feature power-wise. Yes, you do get these powerful spell school spells that are like specialized and make sense thematically and mechanically. Uh, they are always prepared for you, but I, I don't think it would hurt to have a bit of extra oomph with your features because remember you despite them being prepared for you for free you still have to spend a spell slot in order to cast them and spell slots are always a limited resource uh, and uh, being able to use your features instead of spell slots is much better we we just we've just seen how awesome these circle of shepherd and circle of moon features are so buffing up these, these, uh, these, uh, these, like for example, circle of spores features would make sense in my opinion. Unfortunately, this is a done deal. It's a set in stone. This is already official class. I don't think we will ever ever see a change in it. Um, so yeah, that's it for the level six spreading spores. At level ten. You get a feature which denies you the use like of a level 2 feature because it says in this feature that when you use it you can't use this. Um, it has a very limited AoE, it's, it's like, range is only 30 feet away. It's a very situational ability due to those facts. I don't feel this feature personally that like... I feel like, I think whenever you get features like this that cancel, disable your other features directly, like they, they, they are they are in, in a clash, like they directly, it's like an anti-synergy. And I think it's a bad road to take, I think it's a bad design decision. Um, I'm not hating on the designers, whoever desi designed this, I think it's a cool flavor, the spells are very powerful and stuff like that, but I don't think it's a good road to take. To actually make the features that directly combat each other cancel and deny each I, I, I just I'm not a fan of that. Um, you might disagree. I just I, I'm I, I'm just I just hold this strong belief that features should uh, don't don't need to synergize all the time, but should at least not cancel each other out. And with this, there's a direct anti-synergy. There's a direct cancellation effect between each other and the feature in itself as a level 10 is still kind of weak because the limited range, very limited AoE effect, I don't know, I don't like it. Fungal body at 14th level, now I like this, I like this feature. You can't be blinded, deaf and frightened or poisoned, period. These four conditions, you are not limited, for example, similar to land druid who has uh, this like uh, immunity to plants and beasts against attack, like it's very, it's, it's situational. With this, with the spores, you are immune to these effects, whatever, and you are also immune to the additional critical hit damage against yourself, uh, unless you're incapacitated, right? Uh, while this feature is kind of like plain and simplistic for a level 14 feature, it's like only basically one sentence, um, it's definitely more useful again and objectively better than that land, land Druid's 14th level feature. 
Um, and even like the Moon Druid 14 level feature is less use, less powerful than this one. But I think like considering the fact that all of these other Circle of the Spores features are kind of mediocre, meh, underwhelming. At least you get something a bit more useful at level 14. Um, so yeah, I like this. <clears throat> Especially considering that some monsters that hit you for like 7d6 damage. And then crit that. That's additional 7d6 damage. It's like... Yeah, I mean... This can actually be a substantial damage decrease depending on the situation, right? And at 14th level you are definitely gonna come up against some monsters that are um, powerful. That deal a lot of damage. Circle of Twilight is an unearthed arcana um, uh, b -b 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 circle. I'm not gonna review those unearthed arcanas. Um, it's just like... A, unwritten rule on this channel because these are subject to change they are often unbalanced they are often like modified and uh, discarded and stuff like that yeah so that's about it for the circles and going back to the main like general features after one hour and 20 minutes of me talking non-stop god damn i i really can't make make myself brief anyway um timeless body beast spells at arch druid all four especially these two ones are yeah, they're fairly late, they're like level 18 and above, but they are ridiculous, man. Timeless body, starting at 18th level, for every 10 years that pass, your body ages only one year. Yeah, it's more like a ribbon feature, but it does have that cool factor to it. The concept of living for several, several hundred years definitely appeals to me. I'm sure a lot of other people, it, it appeals to a lot of other people as well. I mean, this feature basically lends itself so well to making that NPC druid of high level um, who is like this wise character at the twilight of his life uh, who, who's got who's amassed this massive wisdom and can help the players or in their adventures and with their problems um, beast spells while in wild shape form you can use spells that don't require material components this is a major power bump because a lot of druid spells have no material components and this is a substantial power bump especially for a moon druid because on top of you having those ridiculous beast forms of challenge rating 6 um, and challenge rating 6 is basically just one beast a mammoth um, which is look look at this like like at level 18 you get to turn into this two times between short rests yeah, 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 look at this. Just look at, look at the damage. Damn. Damn. DC 18 strength saving throw or knock pro. DC 18, man. Hit points. Damn. Not a lot of natural armor, but still. Jesus Christ. Alright, moving on, moving back to the, to the, to the beast, uh, to the beast spell. So yeah, I mean, you can turn into a mammoth as a moon druid level 18, and then continue casting spells which we uh, which i will uh, reveal which i will uh, do a detailed overview similar to this one in another video that i'm going to upload maybe even today or probably like you know tomorrow or a couple of days so yeah i mean this is great this is a great great 18th level feature and then as if this wasn't enough level 20 one of the best if not the best capstone feature at level 20 your druid becomes nigh invisible invincible like it's probably it's probably the best capstone feature i mean yeah i mean B barbarian has a cool one but i don't know man this you can use your wild shape an unlimited number of times so that means that Again, if you're a moon druid, for example, specifically moon druid, this feature is even more ridiculous. Because you can remain in your mammoth form, which has 126 hit points, uh, virtually indefinitely, while being able to deal damage. Uh, remember, uh, all other druids use their wild shape, they can wild shape using their action. As a moon druid you use your bonus action to turn into a mammoth and then you have your action to gore or stomp your opponent, right? So, 
this is crazy, especially for a moon druid, but every other druid is like a major, major power bump because you can just keep actioning yourself into like challenge rating one creatures, right? Which, which like fairly, fairly high, like a lot of those, like fairly, fairly good, right? Challenge rating one, decent creatures, right? Giant hyena, like 40 hit points, right? 45. So yeah, I mean, even that is a decent number of hit points. Not a lot of monsters are able to deal consistently 45 or more damage per round, right? And even if they do, on the next turn, you just use your action to turn into a, into a, a, into that thing again. So, pfft, dude, this is a powerful feature. Um, and on top of that, on top of all of that, as if this and this wasn't enough. You can completely ignore all three spell components, even the material ones, unless those material components do have a cost attached to them and or are consumed by the spell. Um, at this point, at level 20, you are basically a demigod of nature and in my opinion, this is what capstone level 20 features should be across all classes. Looking at you, Monk, looking at you, Sorcerer, looking at you, Bard. Their level 20 features, they are nowhere close to Druid's level 20 feature. Uh, sadly, uh, it's kind of redundant, but yeah, I mean, it's not always the case that classes that get such powerful level 20 features. But with Druid, you can definitely rest assured that you will be a force of nature, literally when you finally reach that max level, uh, the level 20, which D&D 5th edition offers. With that said, that's it for this video. If you like this video, like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the bell button. You know the drill. Uh, let me know in the comments down below if I do... If I do forget to post these links down below. So I need to put... I'll put this here so I know what I need to put, so I need to put these elementals, right? Um, oh, sorry, I screwed up, so I need to put all of that. Okay, plants, elementals, and I think that's about it, right? Um, yeah, okay, so that's about it for the video. Again, like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the bell button. I'm going to have a, a detailed overview of druid spells done soon, maybe even later today. Um, so watch out for that, stay tuned, and with that said, me next Munchkin out, and uh, talk to you soon.